So this is uh, what we are going to be covering today uh, before starting. It's important to, to know what is a PowerPoint presentation. It's simply like the cards that professors used to have in their hands many years ago when we didn't have this technology. Many teachers used to have their notes in cards or any paper or something so they could follow the logical process and not forget something. Okay, but this is in no way a substitute for the book. Okay, remember this is my interpretation of what the book says with some details that maybe you need more, some details that you maybe are totally uh, not not important for the practice, but we simply talk about them. Um, I really don't know how someone can study using a PowerPoint. Yeah. Even I made this PowerPoint, okay, during the past days, and next year I'm going to redo it again, because I, when I look at the past year PowerPoint, I say, what is this? This makes no sense at all. At least for me that I made it, then I have to do a new one with my new ideas, no? So there you have the learning objectives. At, uh, in the notes, you have the more specific ones, the same that you have in the syllabus. Okay, physiology, you, are, you have studied physiology for sure many times, and here we have chosen some specific topics about physiology that are important for the clinical practice. Okay, before starting any of these things, always remember something. As medical providers, as healthcare providers, as practitioners, clinicians, we are users of these sciences. We use physiology, we use anatomy, we use different sciences to work. We are not going to be specialists in physiology. Okay, of course, if you love physiology and you want to go deeper into physiology, great. Okay, but you don't need to know every specific detail. We, uh, we use computers, and we may be better or worse using computers. We don't know to understand how the computer works and every detail. Okay, when I click here, where the electricity goes and what happens there, what is the frequency, what, we don't need to know that. We simply know that when you click here or double click there, something will happen, and that always happens. There is a theory that is called the black box theory. It has nothing to do with the black box of the airplanes. That is, that you know that when you do an action, there is a response, okay? And it's consistent. And you don't need to understand what is inside the black box. What is the mechanism? You don't need to understand that, okay? There, there are different things that are very important to understand and some others that are not critical, okay? And that's the way we are gonna approach physiology, okay? Teaching only what you are gonna need and, we, and what we are gonna need to, okay? That you know to teach the path of physiology. In the case of Professor Santos Mendes, he's gonna teach you the anatomy that you're gonna need for physical diagnosis, okay? So we are gonna build on that. That's why it's important that you retain these things for a long time. Most of what we are going to be studying is homeostasis, how the body, how the organs work to maintain a relatively stable internal environment. Okay? When we say internal environment, we are not talking about the inside of the body. We are talking about the blood and the extracellular fluids. Okay? The extracellular compartment. We are not going to be talking about intracellular physiology or about a molecular biology. Maybe we mentioned some things there, but we are not gonna study anything that is happening inside the cells. How the body maintains a relatively constant extracellular compartment. And notice that I clarified there the word relatively stable and that homeostasis has to do with that dynamic constancy. What is that? We don't have anything in equilibrium in the body. We only achieve equilibrium when we die, that everything sh stops, okay? Normally we have variations. Hormones levels go up and down, temperature goes up and down, blood pressure up and down, but always variations around a mean value, 
or an average value, okay? And that is what homeostatic mechanisms try to achieve. And there are many mechanisms to maintain that. Most of the mechanisms that work in homeostasis are negative feedback loops or negative feedback mechanisms. Okay, we are gonna study other types of feedbacks like positive feedback and feed forward or anticipatory responses. Okay, they are not homeostatic. Okay, homeostasis is everything that tries to take the different variables, blood pressure, sodium, etc., to the mean. If it goes up, we'll take, take it down. Okay, if it goes down, we'll take it up. So, living beings, okay, have many characteristics that you have studied. If you studied biology or anatomy, physiology, you have read this many times. We are going to be focusing on the ones that are here in bold letters. This is going to be all the time homeostasis, but we are going to also talk about how cells talk to each other, the signaling. Okay, it's impossible to work together if we don't talk to each other. Cells need to talk to one another. Okay, I wish we, for example, every time I'm driving and I see someone changing the lane without signaling, How can we <laughs> not, have, not drive and not crash with all of these uh, things that happen? Response, of course, every time there is a, a stimulus, there is gonna be a response from the body and you're gonna see how complex this is. And we're gonna be talking about metabolism. And of course, we are gonna mention other uh, functions of the living beings, adaptation, but that is going to be more in part of physiology, how the body adapts to damage, to injury, to different changes. Organization is something that you have studied many times, these levels of organization. Uh, we are going to be studying homeostasis in different levels, tissue, the organ, the system levels. I'm not going to be talking about growth too much. And reproduction, yes, of course. The final uh, objective of the body Okay, survival, reproduction are probably the two most uh, important functions of a human body. Reproduction doesn't necessarily mean that you have to reproduce yourself. You can help others to reproduce. You know? Take care of your, uh, your different people in your family, your niece, your etc. Babies of other people. So, Homeostasis, and this is a part that I want you to pay uh, a lot of attention because if you learn this and learn how to do what I'm gonna tell you, you already can say that you passed 40% of the physiology. Okay, everything that we are gonna be teaching in physiology and in pathophysiology has to do with this diagram homeostatic mechanisms. There are many systems to maintain homeostasis of different variables, okay? All of them have sensors that will detect any variation in some variables that we call regulated variables. Sorry, control vari uh, uh, regulated variables, which are the ones that are critical for survival. Let's say blood pressure is probably the most important variable in the body, the one that the, our body is mostly focused on. Okay, our body is able to put apart every other thing to maintain the perfusion to the brain. Okay, let's say uh, we are in a very warm environment. Okay, our temperature is increasing. Our body will activate mechanisms to dissipate heat. Vasodilation, sweating, we start losing fluid, our blood pressure drops, fluid goes out, fluid goes out, the body is trying to maintain temperature, but there is a moment when the blood pressure is dangerously low. In that moment, temperature is not important. Vasoconstriction, no more sweating, we need to maintain the perfusion to the brain. Doesn't matter if the internal temperature goes up. So there are priorities in our body 
And the number one is perfusion to the brain. Okay, our body's gonna sacrifice everything else just to maintain the blood flowing to the brain. Okay, we're gonna be seeing some examples. Now, the sensors detect variations in these variables and send this information, communication, to the control centers, endocrine, nervous system, and they decide what to do. And for that, they will activate effectors. Can be sweat glands, can be endocrine glands, can be muscles, to do something. Okay, and that will modify the initial variable that stimulated the process, of course, in the opposite direction. If it was going up, take it down, and vice versa. Now, we are going to see that this is not simple. Uh, there are some other steps here. Because sometimes, for example, to control the blood pressure, let's say the blood pressure is too low. Okay, the effectors don't directly take the blood pressure up. The effectors will act on other variables, heart rate, blood vessels, and will modify these variables in order to modify the blood pressure. Okay, these other variables are the ones that we call controlled variables, not regulated. We don't have any sensor in the body for the heart rate. We have sensors for the blood pressure in the carotid bodies, in the aortic arc. But we don't have any sensor that tells us, oh, the heart rate is too low, the heart rate is, is too high. Okay, so the blood pressure is a control, it's a regulated variable. And the heart rate, for example, is a control variable. Now, we are going to be complicating this a little bit more. Okay, we have here exactly the same thing, but now we have included the control variable. That is the one, or several of them can modify the regulated one. Okay, notice that we have taken the same diagram and we have added an extra variable there, that is the one that, when it varies, will act on the regulated one. And there we have the substitution. The blood pressure goes up or down. That is sensed by the receptors that we have in the carotid bodies, for example, baroreceptors. They will inform the control centers in the brain, central nervous system. Central nervous system sends a response through the autonomic nervous system that will modify the heart rate. Oh, blood pressure is too low. Let me increase the heart rate so the blood pressure goes up. Control centers, we are going to see how they are made. Okay, they decide what is the set point. Okay, the mean arterial pressure of this person is going to be 90 millimeters of mercury. Sometimes the control centers modify the set point. For example, during an infection, the temperature of the body, the set point may be above what we normally have. Okay, during stress situations, the set point for the blood pressure may be higher than when we are not under stress. The same will happen with other systems. Sometimes this happens temporarily, sometimes this happens forever, and we may develop chronic conditions. Now, same diagram, more detail. Drop in blood pressure. Carotid body, baroreceptor sends the drop, inform the central nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system will take a couple of actions. Will decrease every mechanism that tends to lower the blood pressure and will activate all the mechanisms that will increase the blood pressure. So there will be an inhibition of the parasympathetic nervous system and activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, what are the control variables that will act to modify and increase the blood pressure? Heart rate, the contractility of the heart, and vasoconstriction. Okay, if you learn how to do this for every process that we are gonna study in the body, you don't need to read chapters and chapters and chapters of books and watch videos and videos and videos. Learning is something that you will do to yourselves. If you tell me, I wanna develop more muscles, 
I'm, I'm not gonna tell you, watch videos about uh, weightlifting. No, you have to do the weightlifting. If you hire a personal trainer for that, you're not gonna pay the personal trainer for them to work out for you. You have to work out, you have to sweat. If you don't sweat, you're not gonna develop muscle. Okay, there is a saying that I like that says, if you don't hate your personal trainer, fire him or them. Okay, if you don't go to the gym to, to do jokes and, and be nice and the personal trainer to be nice to you, no. You're paying this person for them to push you to do something. Because it's your work, the one that is gonna pay up. Okay, for example, if one student makes these diagrams and they give it to another, that has no benefit. If I read someone else's notes or I, or I get someone else's diagram, no, it's simply a, an act of sharing that is great, but it doesn't benefit for the learning. Okay, it's the doing, okay, what actually produces the learning. Now, this is a bit more complicated for you to see how complex physiology can get. Let's say someone is standing, okay? Someone is in bed and they stand up very quickly, or someone is bleeding, or someone is very severely dehydrated. All of that is gonna produce a drop in blood pressure. These are different situations. Why? There is a drop in blood pressure because there is less blood going to the heart. There is a decreased venous return that decreases the amount of blood that the heart is pumping or stroke volume the low blood pressure, this is uh, the, the point where the other diagram started, this drop will be sent by the baroreceptors, okay? They are gonna stretch, they are gonna decrease the firing, and, and be, let me clarify something before I continue. This is not cardiovascular system physiology, we are simply explaining homeostasis, okay? So you don't need to, oh my goodness, I, I, I don't understand this. Professor, could you clarify? Go to the learning objectives of today's uh, lecture. This is simply an example and a diagram that I recommend you to use, but not this, create yours in every system. Okay, that will be the response of the, well, the signal from the receptors to the nervous system, decrease firing, that will decrease the output of the parasympathetic and will activate the sympathetic nervous system that will increase the contractility heart rate and will produce peripheral vasoconstriction. The blood pressure will decrease minimally. Okay, why I put that? Did you say, Professor, the blood pressure increases? Yes, increases. What it says is, let's say the blood pressure was here when I was lying in bed, it dropped to here when I stand it up, and the response is not gonna be up to here, it's gonna be up to here. At least immediately, okay? It's simply gonna prevent that my blood pressure drops too much or for too long. Okay, it's gonna increase up to here, it's a minimal decrease, and then when I go to start walking, etc., it's gonna go to where it's uh, decided by the set point of my control center. Now, homeostasis is a process, as I told you before, that tries to maintain the different variables oscillating around a mean value. Okay, I'm representing here only the systolic pressure. They will try to maintain the systolic pressure around 120. Sometimes the regulatory mechanisms fail Okay, or the challenge is too large, it's a very bad challenge. And the blood pressure, for example, or other variables oscillate far away from the mean. Okay, when this happens, the homeostatic mechanism is not gonna be enough. We need to activate other systems. Okay, we need to activate other organs that will help. Okay, and we don't call that homeostasis. We call that heterostasis or allostasis. 
Okay, and that's what we study in pathophysiology. How the body works under abnormal conditions or when the variables go very far away from the normal values. And that other different conditions. Now, the farther away that the variable moves from the mean, okay, the greater the, what we call the allostatic load. Okay, let's say that the lowest value of homeostatic mechanisms is 110. If it goes to 115, there is a, an allostatic load of five. Okay, if it goes very, very badly down to 90, now we have an allostatic load of 20. And the greater the allostatic load, the more okay, mechanisms we need to activate, and maybe for a, the longer time. Okay, and then we talk sometimes about an allostatic overload. If it goes very far away from the mean, or if it extends for a very long time, and we need to have these extra mechanisms active for a very, very long time. Because that, okay, this activating other systems or activating these systems for a very long time is gonna represent a metabolic challenge for the body. We have to be using resources that we normally would use for other purposes. Okay, for example, when we are under, under a situation of chronic stress, okay, to maintain homeostasis, we need to use resources that maybe were destined to reproduction or immunity. And what is the result of that? That we have a weak immune system and that we don't reproduce properly. Okay, don't have kids or have difficulties getting pregnant or for, with lactation or with something else. There are different criteria for allostatic overload. Okay, and that's something that you will read later there has to be a source of this stress, okay? Any acute or chronic stressful event. Okay, and then there are some symptoms associated. Difficulty sleeping, restless sleep, early morning awakening, lack of energy, dizziness, okay? Impairment in social or occupational functioning. Notice that there has to be either, but A has to be present and then at least two of the following things. Okay, there are different degrees. Some people may have simply some little anxiety and tiredness. Other people may have difficulties even, even at work, okay, or problems with social skills overwhelmed by different uh, things that we have to do. Simply going to the supermarket may be stressful. Now, entering into physiology, uh, and, that, and this is, this is going to explain you why I tell that anatomy and physiology have nothing to do. When you study anatomy, they present you the body in the anatomical position, the cavities, the systems, the different planes, the different sections, different things that anatomists are very concerned with. In physiology, we don't care about that. For physiology, the body is simply that. There is an intracellular compartment and an extracellular compartment. And the extracellular is divided into intravascular and interstitial. Okay, there is some distribution. Okay, these compartments are very different uh, regarding their amount of water and the composition. Okay, for example, this uh, intracellular compartment contains two thirds of the body water while the other third is in the extracellular. Notice that also the ions are different. Okay, for example, uh, the intracellular compartment has a lot of magnesium, phosphate, and potassium, while the extracellular has more sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Okay, these two compartments, the interstitial and the intravascular, they are very similar except for the amount of proteins. Okay, there are many proteins inside the blood vessels, and we are not supposed to have many proteins in the interstitial space. Also notice that the barrier, 
between the cells and the extracellular compartment is a very strong and tight barrier, the cell membrane that is selectively permeable, while the barrier between the intravascular and the interstitial is more flexible. It will let everything pass except proteins. So we have what we call equilibrium between the intravascular and the interstitial compartments. There is the same concentration of sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, etc. across these two spaces. The only thing that is not in equilibrium is the proteins. Albumin, antibodies, etc. are not supposed to freely go into the interstitial space. And these are the, the, the main differences. And one maintains the difference between the intracellular and extracellular compartment. This thing that we have here, the sodium potassium pump, that will be taking the excess sodium out away from the cells into the interstitial space and will be taking potassium in. And that requires a lot of ATP. And the reason why we breathe and eat is simply to provide ATP to this sodium potassium pump. We eat, doesn't matter what you eat, everything is going to be converted into glucose and glucose will co be combined with oxygen uh, to make ATP, to maintain those many sodium potassium pumps working and maintaining this situation that we call steady state. Once the sodium potassium pump stops working, the sodium and the potassium will equilibrate and that's the end of life. So that's why I say equilibrium is the end of life because if you, need, you have an equilibrium in between the intracellular and extracellular spaces, we can't do anything. Muscles can't contract, nerves can't transmit impulses, so life ends. And here you see a bigger picture of that. Okay, we breathe, we eat to provide okay, the, 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 the fuel to the sodium potassium pump that maintains the steady state, the difference in the composition between the intracellular and extracellular compartment. Okay, the most important cation inside the cells is potassium, and there are also some proteins. Okay, notice that here we have the extracellular compartment. The intravascular has sodium and proteins too, albumin, the most important, while the interstitial fluid, sodium. No proteins there. Okay, as a result of this work of the sodium potassium pump, we are going to produce several wastes. Not only that, there are many different processes in the cells that produce waste, but every waste is going to be eliminated by the kidneys that also eliminate excess acid, excess, excess base. Intestines are going to eliminate lots of wastes too. Skin too, okay? The sweat glands eliminate wastes as well. Okay, so from here, what is important is to understand the differences between these compartments. Okay, and also that we have a steady state, concept of steady state, a constant difference between the intra and extracellular compartments and that this is maintained by the sodium potassium pump. Okay, where we have equilibrium or almost equilibrium between the intravascular and interstitial spaces. Ions move freely, okay, uh, uh, or are exchanged freely in between these two spaces. The only thing that doesn't move freely is albumin, the proteins. Unless there is a damage in the, in the endothelium or something else. So we have these variables that we were explaining. There are several variables that are critical okay, for the body. Okay, the most important, remember, is the blood pressure. Okay, but there are other uh, regulated variables, oxygen and CO2 concentration, pH, the blood volume, the osmolality of the extracellular fluid, 
the temperature of the body, the core temperature, the body doesn't care about the temperature of the skin, it's the core temperature, the one that can't vary, and the concentration of glucose and different ions in the body. So how are these homeostatic regulatory control systems made? Well, we already saw the diagrams okay, that I presented, but here we have a description of these components and, a more, and more detail about the control center. There is a sensor that will sense the variable, the regulated variables, that is considered the input signal. Okay, these sensors are like measuring devices. Okay, the sensors measure the value of this variable and sense the signal of that value okay, to the control center. Control centers are composed of a couple of things. They have an error detector and a controller. Okay, the error detector is the one that compares the value, let's say blood pressure, what is the current value? Is, uh, let's say the mean arterial pressure is 90. Let me compare this 90 with the set point. Oh, 90, 90 is okay, no problem. 95, mm, there is a difference. 85, there is a difference, and that information is going to be sent to the controller. The controller interprets the information from the error detector, there is plus 5, there is minus 5, and determines what is the adequate response, and what is the magnitude, because if the difference is 5, okay, I need to activate this. But if there is a difference of 20, oh my goodness, I have to activate this and this, and very quickly. Okay, that's the process, okay, the controller sends output signal to the effectors that generally are muscles or glands. Okay, the, the effector organs act in response to the signals from the controller and they will act on different controlled variables to modify the regulated variable. The response is gonna produce a change in the regulated variable and these homeostatic systems, okay, there are different types. We have local control systems and long distance control systems that we call reflex pathways. For example, locally in the tissues, we have paracrine signals, autocrine signals, and the reflex pathways or the long distance controllers are those that have to do with the nervous system, with the endocrine system, and also cytokines or different types of inflammatory mediators that we are going to be studying in different systems. So this is exactly the same, but in a diagram. You have the input, the value of the regulated variable that we call X, okay, the control center, okay, has an error detector and a controller, and decides the set point. The error detector, uh, detector will compare the value of the variable with, the, with that of the set point, and we'll send information to the controller that will decide the magnitude and the type of response that we are gonna have in that moment, okay, to modify the, the value of the regulated variable when there is any disturbance or any change. And most of these mechanisms are negative feedback loops that are the only homeostatic, homeostatic way okay, of regulating the body. A feedback is a flow of information okay, along a closed loop, okay, that closed loop that exactly as we saw here. Okay. And just remember that the set points may vary the values Okay, in different situations, fever, for example, is an example. And also the variations in the levels of hormones during the menstrual cycle or during the day. Okay, cortisol, for example, is very high at the, when we wake up and very low at the end of the day. That means that during the day, the set point for cortisol levels varies. Okay, these varies, these are what we call these uh, cycles, okay, that come be daily cycles or it can be monthly cycles. Now remember that only negative feedback systems are homeostatic. Okay, but 
not everything that has a negative feedback, yeah, that's something that, that is also something that we need to be aware of. But we have other reflexes that have nothing to do with the maintaining a balance in the extracellular compartment. Okay, these muscle reflexes or tendon reflexes, yeah, they have a stimulus, they have a controller, they have a feedback loop, they have a response, but that has nothing to do with the regulation of the internal environment, which is blood and interstitial fluid. Then we have uh, this diagram that shows exactly, for those that have more visual learning styles, okay, it's more or less the same diagram, but it's simply showing you that the response okay, is, gonna, uh, is gonna be taking this variable in the opposite direction as it was going, okay, back to set point. Then we have a, what we call the fit forward or anticipation feedback. Okay, these are mechanisms that promote a response before there is an actual change in the value of the variable. For example, if you measure your heart rate right now, maybe it is 60, and if you go every day to the gym, and you drive now to the gym, and you park your car, and when you stand at the door of the gym, your heart rate is gonna be 85 because your body knows what you are gonna do there. And it's preparing your body for working out. The same thing happens, for example, with the temperature. If we enter in a cold room, our hypothalamus is not gonna wait for the core temperature of the body to drop to start activating the heat producing mechanisms. Okay, so we have two sets of detectors of temperature. Some of the skin, some in the hypothalamus itself. Once we feel there is a cold environment in the skin, we activate the heat production. The same happens with glucose. If we start eating an ice cream, we are gonna send signals to the pancreas that sugar is gonna go to the blood. And we produce chemicals that we call incretins. Okay, when we start eating the sugar, sugar is maybe in the mouth or going into the stomach, the incretins tell the pancreas, hey, sugar is coming, pancreas produces insulin, so when glucose enters the blood, insulin is already there and takes it immediately inside the cells. That is anticipatory response, what we call feed forward feedback. This is not homeostatic, but helps to save energy okay, helps to prevent allostasis. Because if we have suddenly the sugar in the blood, now the pancreas has to work a lot, and that's not good. It's better to do things little by little. This is the example of the body temperature. We have two sets of thermoreceptors. Hypothalamus measures the temperature of the blood in the brain, and the skin receptors, the external one and we start shivering, producing heat, and having vasoconstriction long before the core temperature drops. It's an anticipation response. And this is the example of the incretins. Okay, when glucose enters the digestive tract, insulin starts going up because we are producing this substance that is called glucagon-like peptide one and other incretins that will stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin. For example, if you put IV glucose, that doesn't happen. Okay, if you measure the insulin levels now, and when someone eats something that contains sugar and the sugar enters in the stomach, insulin goes up, but the blood sugar levels are not up yet. When the sugar levels go up, then insulin increases even more because now the pancreas is detecting that. But if you give IV glucose, Glucose increases, and then insulin starts. Oh my goodness, what's going on here? No one told me that there was sugar on the way. That's the way our organs communicate. For example, in people with diabetes type two, there could be a problem in some of them with low incretin production. And there is a treatment, okay, to, in that direction. 
Sometimes they produce incretins, but they are degraded very quickly. So we give inhibitors of the degradation of the incretins. Okay, there are different things that you're gonna be learning. And that's the importance of learning this very well. Because when you study the pharmacology, and if you don't remember what incretins are and what is the effect of incretins and what can happen, then it's impossible to understand the mechanism of action of the medication. And then maybe you need to go, oh my goodness, I have to study all this for pharmacology, but I don't remember what incretins are, so let me go to the physiology. So let me, and then you're wasting a lot of time that you have to dedicate to the other because the other medications in pharmacology. This is a representation of this feedforward regulation. I've tried to do this diagram many times and I never considered it perfect, but you have the idea. Okay, we have two sets of sensors that are measuring the same variable. Okay, some sensors send information to feedforward controllers that will activate effectors before there is a change in the variable. Okay, these effectors are gonna try to prevent any dramatic change in the regulated variable. Of course, there are, there are normal mechanisms, uh, feedback, uh, negative feedback mechanisms involved in that. Because sometimes the feedforward uh, goes beyond what is expected. Okay, let's say we enter in a cold room and we activate a lot of heat production, but we go away very fast. Oh my goodness, now, now what I do with all this heat? So there has to be a negative feedback mechanism trying to adjust. Okay, that was too much or that was too little. Okay, it's more or less like if you use analogies of normal life, you can have an idea. The importance of this feedback uh, or anticipatory response is that they cooperate to minimize the disturbances and prevent the overwork of the bike. And positive feedback, well, this is a mechanism that simply when detects a change in one direction, promotes, okay, that the effectors work to continue moving the variable in the same direction. So these mechanisms are not homeostatic by definition. They don't lead to stability or regulation of anything. Of course, they are important. We need them, for example, in the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle, micturition reflex, uh, blood clotting, depolarization, childbirth, etc. We need them, but just for a very a short amount of time. So the effectors in the case of positive feedback simply will amplify okay, what was the primary stimulus. And well, this is uh, what we had for today. We are gonna continue with the rest Okay, on the next encounter. I wanted to ask if there is any question 